on this International Day of the Midwife, where we are thinking about midwives as defenders of women's rights. Our next speaker is going to explore the midwife's role in defending the rights of the birth partner too. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ian Kemp. Ian commenced his midwifery career as a mature student several years after being present at the birth of his four children. They were wonderful, life-changing moments for Ian as a husband, a father and a man. And eventually after his midwifery training and some time as a midwife, he was inspired to become a consultant midwife and completed his MA in midwifery, including research into why dads are not allowed to be present at the birth of their baby when their um, partner's having a section under general anaesthetic. Ian's still a midwife, but he doesn't currently work in the NHS and he's passionate about women's choice and the inclusion of fathers from the outset. So Ian, if you wouldn't mind uh, unmuting yourself and uh, take us through your research, welcome. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> in order to put a look, just a little bit of context into why I looked at this subject, uh, almost 30 years ago, on the 20th of April, uh, 1989, my wife Julie went into labour with our first child, uh, Christopher. Um, I'd done all the preparation. I wasn't a midwife then. We'd done all the preparation. I'd done the antenatal classes. And um, when she went into her labour, uh, the early hours of the morning, we rang the local hospital. Um, we went up to the hospital and we were met at the door by an elderly porter. Uh, well, I say elderly, elderly to me at the time. Um, he asked me to wait in a room and he wandered off with my wife to the labour ward. I was in that room for about 45, 50 minutes, something like that. And because I didn't know what was happening, no one came and told me, you start making up what could be wrong. Um, and I'd worked myself into such a state so that by the time... I don't know whether it was a nurse or a midwife came in to get me uh, at the end of that uh, time. I was convinced they were coming in to tell me that my wife or my uh, unborn baby uh, had died, or both. Um, they hadn't. Julie went on to birth our baby, our eldest, Christopher, who's just turned 30, um, and she went to have another four children. That was a very traumatic... The, the, the being left like that is one of the hardest things I ever went through not knowing it's frightening daunting i was angry i was it's horrible anyway but there's I, I put it to the back of my mind we got on with being a father i went back to work and julie went on with bringing up the children um i then went on to be a midwife several years later and it's part of my student midwife that it, i was reminded of what had happened i was sat i've been to a couple of general anaesthetic sections uh, as a student midwife with my mentor and the women and it's great when you've saved mum and baby's lives or you're part of the team that does it uh one that would go in for a spinal section and um they had to convert to a ga section so dad and i had helped him dress well i hadn't helped him dress he dressed himself we we're both in our scrubs in theater because they were going to had to go to ga section I took him out and I sat with him and I watched that father and it reminded me so much of what I went through. And that is what made me question because a student midwife was meant to question. So I'm going to run through the slides. Um, babies come into the world or arrive in this world in seven different, several different ways, sorry. Um, oh, oh, one second, sorry, I'm getting used to the technology. And the majority of dads attend the birth of the child. Um, at the time, it was about 86%. Um, but I will say, yes, certainly from experience, the majority attend the birth. But what of the other 14%? Well, um, work commitments are, are fairly common, especially if they're in the forces. They may be separated from mum. It may be that she doesn't want him there, which is perfectly valid. Uh, similarly, it may be that he doesn't want to be there. However, there's a small percentage that aren't allowed uh, due to the baby being birthed by a general anaesthetic uh, cesarean section. Um, and it was this that sort of questioned after I saw that dad. Um, previous practice at my trust was the GA sections were put, performed as an emergency. Um, the priority is and was uh, a live mum and baby, which is, is only right. It, yeah, that is oh, got to be the priority. Once the baby was out and checked okay by the midwife or the paediatrician, it was placed on a warming mattress in a cot, uh, never leaving mum's side, even though she was unconscious 
um, we had a policy where we were where babies shouldn't leave mum's side. Um, dad, however, is normally uh, left in a waiting room or the labour ward room. Um, quite often they went outside to pace the floor and we didn't know where they were, so we we, we couldn't update them um, and because we were all busy. Uh, they're usually informed of the birth, etc., but it's approximately two hours before he sees his partner and his newborn. If babies were born in the middle of the night, they didn't get them to see the morning after unless they hung around the lift to see them being transferred. Um, I asked my colleagues why. I, I, I didn't understand why. I needed to understand it. And as, like I say, students, we were asked to, um, we, we were asked to question practice. Um, doesn't always go down well with the mentors, but uh, and I come to my colleagues at the time that said men wouldn't like to see the partners like that. Well, what, naked? I, to, this, to my mind, that's how they got there in the first place. Um, staff haven't got time to deal with partners if they get upset or annoyed, and they don't allow partners into the theatre on the general side. So why should this be any different? Um, I went um, after doing my. I had to do my master's degree in midwifery in order to become a consultant midwife. So we had to do a research proposal. So part of my research proposal was doing a literature search into this subject because it never really went away. Um, Coppola and Kaiser, they looked at dads whose newborn was in the neonatal intensive care unit. And instead of answering questions, they wanted to talk about the birth. They felt they were abandoned. And literally, as midwives, you can understand that. We just abandoned them and run off with, with mum to save lives. Uh, and at the end of the rope, they felt like they couldn't take any more. Um, I'm not saying for one second that my experience was anything like theirs. But yeah, you just feel, it's awful. It's, it's awful. And they just felt like they were at the end of the rope and like they couldn't take any more. They just wanted to call it a day. Um, Robinson was one of two anaesthetists um, who were, they had a, an anaesthetic debate, sounds like a hoot, but it was published and it was going to come up. Um, he cited maternal satisfaction and choice as a reason to allow partners in. Um, and he quantified this by saying that partners could cope with being there, as it's now common practice for parents to be present when the children are anaesthetized and when you're witnessing resuscitation. Um, so he argued for and the debate um, smile oops, sorry and the debate smiley was arguing against it and they basically said uh, mum and dad have no rights aesthetically women don't want men there um, most men don't want to be there and those that do will prevent the anaesthetist doing the job thereby causing morbidity and mortality he can't support her she's unconscious um, if men faint, they will sue the trust, and this was a real, oh, we're talking 30 years ago, this was a real um, uh, concern back then. <clears throat> and also, they said it was a loss of a bargaining tool, which would result in a rise in GA sections. So from my experience, women that were choosing to birth their baby by cesarean section um, spoke to the anaesthetist and in the, in the antenatal period. Um, and obviously, it's better for mum and baby, for mum to have a spinal and stay awake. Um, and when they're discussing this, some mums obviously wanted to be put to sleep and just woke up. They didn't want to feel any pain, any concern about that. Um, so they said, if you stay awake, we can let your partner come in. His concern was that if we put um, let everybody in irrespective, then you would lose that bargaining tool. Um, these three researchers, or this group of researchers, they looked at the incidence of psychological distress in women at birth of babies by general anaesthetic cesarean section. It was higher, um, not surprisingly. These women uh, frequently cited a missing piece of the birth. So basically, they went to sleep pregnant and woke up with a baby. As such, they weren't sure if it was their baby. Um, this causes big problems with bonding with their baby. Uh, one of the outcomes of this is it's less likely, they are less likely, sorry, to initiate breastfeeding. <clears throat> Yukoti um, focused on men whose partners had an emergency cesarean section with NA anaesthetic, so spinal or general anaesthetic. They cited the level of fear and anxiety felt by these men too high to measure, which resonated with certainly the way I felt and the dad that, dad that I was watching that day. And she, they argue that it's as much an emergency for partners as it is for mum and baby. 
um, <clears throat> I won't really do all my research um, uh, methods primarily because I struggle to say half of these words. I don't know what's an age thing or my false teeth. Um, but the method was in-depth, semi-structured interview. So I wanted to find out what I wanted to do, but I also wanted to enable them to tell their story. So um, almost prompts, if you will. Um, I had a purposive sample, purposive in that I only asked women and their partners whose baby has been birthed by cesarean section under the general anaesthetic. Due to a delay in the research getting ethical approval, like I was only able to interview eight participants in a total of five interviews. Um, I asked each five set questions, they were all the same. Interviews were audio recorded on a small dictaphone, they were then transcribed and then analysed. Um, Semi-structured questions were here, because you tell me what happened at the birth of your son or daughter, what were your thoughts and feelings at the time, do you feel any differently now that several weeks have passed? Um, sorry, I forgot to mention, I interviewed them normally at home, they were invited to come to the hospital, but they all chose to be interviewed at home in their own homes. In your opinion, should expected fathers be allowed to accompany their partners? And finally, could you give me a reason why they should or should not? Um, like I said, I got ethics approval, um, first from the regional thing, which was a bit daunting, uh, then from my university, which was U University of Central Lancashire, and then the R&D department of my trust. Thematic analysis, I was told there's a way you can get a Q computer program, or there was at the time, and you fed all your information into there, your data into there, and it threw out the themes. I, however, different, I'm different. <laughs> I had a friend who had, um, he chose to do it by bits of paper on the floor. I this, did this all over my wife's uh, new wallpaper in the lounge. Um, I don't know if you can see that a bit closer. Um, so this is what we look for themes. So similar things that people said, I don't know what is going on. Uh, nobody spoke to me um, and stuff like that. I sorted them all into different areas. Um, I came out with seven themes. Um, it was missing pieces of birth, which had been found already. Similarly, bonding with a baby. Men's feelings were when abandoned. Um, communication, or should I say lack of. A lack of antenatal preparation. Then the basic question of should dads be at the birth, because all be these people had uh, formulated ideas saying they don't want them there, etc. No one had asked them, to my knowledge. And then risk obsessed, which I wasn't expecting the last one. These are the quotes, so basically time where everything was written, so it's not that my bad English, it was just um, what we're doing. So missing piece of the birth. I didn't even know what planet I was on. That was why I missed the feelings afterwards. I saw my sister with a baby and I thought she'd had a baby. Um, bonding with a baby. I didn't hold him straight away. It was a couple of hours after. I didn't have a connection. I felt like I didn't have a bond with him. And the last one, the second one that was to me was sad, still now he won't look at me. For ages he just did not look at me. He looks at everyone else, but he'll just look around me. I hold him and it's like he's just not bothered about me. I was with this lady when she was interviewing, the baby was looking perfectly like any baby would look at the mother, but her perception of what we've done as midwives to her. Um, men's feelings when abandoned. Um, this is the whole reason I kicked off with this research. It's awful, it's the worst thing you can ever imagine. A thousand questions a minute. If everything was all right, they would have told me by now. There's quite a lot of anger, really. I wanted to protect my wife, but I knew I wasn't allowed. Frustration. And you've got some stupid electrician at the end of the corridor saying something about flatlining. And that's winding me up even more, because I didn't know he was an electrician at the time. I got the date of this gentleman and his wife's date of birth. Um, I went back, and apparently they were servicing just outside the theatre where this dad was sat, he'd been brought in and then gone to GA, so he'd been sat outside, so he was sat uh, uh, on a chair outside the theatre looking at the double doors. Just around the corner we have our defibrillator and they were servicing the machine and that's the only thing I can assimilate to, that someone had been in there saying, yes, it's doing its flatline, they were servicing it. But because no one was with him, he thought that was his wife, his baby. Um, communication. And this is the whole point about communication um, is because you don't get told. I certainly, as a midwife, was never ever taught to discuss 
all potential uh, outcomes for birth in antenatal classes. Um, and obviously, it's a bit rushed trying to do it. And from the dad's point of view, their communication or lack of was they weren't told antenatally, but they weren't told what was going on during you know the procedure. Antenatal perspiration. In the UK, we have a program called One Born Every Minute. Um, I don't watch it. I choose not to watch it. But it does. It, it's at the birth. It sort of glamorises um, birth and makes makes midwives out to be drinking tea, eating cake, and then just rushing for emergencies. There was one who went for GA. Yeah, the father and like all the scrubs, and then never ending going up with her, waiting a bit to see either of them. I said, when everything's all right, if that happened to her, she wanted him to be with his dad, but no one ever asked her. No one ever said if it happened. Maybe we should be asking. Should dads be at birth? Every single participant said yes. <clears throat> um, I expected some people to say no, especially men. I thought maybe with a risk, but every, every single one was an emphatic yes. Um, the men, not the women, but the men were a bit risk obsessed. And I don't know what society we live in or just the UK, but they were worried about whether we brought germs in and, or getting in the way of doctors and stuff like that, um, but not to interfere with what doctors and nurses do. This reminded me of a, a, a program called Some Mothers Do Have Them, where Michael Crawford was, the baby arrives, I think it's called. If you, there's a link, I believe, somewhere you could uh, watch. Um, so what does cause these problems? These arguments um, were, um, were remarkably similar to those that were cited against allowing dads into normal births in the 60s. Previous to this, uh, a home births and hospital births, dads were left to go to the pub, Pace the corridor. It was in. It was quite used as a comical thing in cartoons and films of the period. Um, and then when, when when women wanted the partners to be there for spinal sections in the seventies, um, and again, as a, aside from my research, nothing to do with maternity relatives. Um, they were allowed into resuscitation of loved ones or parents into the anaesthetic rooms of children. They've all been brought in now and they were proved to be wrong. That there is no evidence whatsoever to keep dads out. And in fact, Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is a children's hospital in London, world renowned, um, they, their, their, their vision is, not vision, their, their values is that the parents have more rights to be there than the staff. And I think, in, as far as GA sections are, I think partners do as well. I agree with that. Does size matter? Um, I'm assuming for you ladies on the call that size doesn't, but as a man, I need to tell you it does. So at my trust, um, there were just over 2,500 births um, between January and October, um, inclusive in 2008. This is how long my research was. I did it in 2011. 590 of these were cesarean section. You can tell the section rate was a lot smaller then. 54% or 2% of the sections were under GA. Obviously, it's not a large number, but, but then this num percentage is applied to the number of births in England and Wales in the same period. It is much larger. I couldn't get the data of Scotland and Northern Ireland. For some reason, it just doesn't want to work. That's over 13,500 um, potentially babies that were born. However, my research highlighted that excluding partners from a GA section is not confined to the UK. And it was certainly common practice in the countries studied, and it may even be worldwide, talking to friends and stuff like that. Therefore, if your percentage of GA sections were applied to the 133 million plus live births worldwide each year, the number is considerably more. That's 2.7 million babies. It matters to these women because they are more likely uh, if we exclude uh, for a GA section, to have a missing piece of their birth. If dad is allowed in, one of the common questions, statements women made um, was that they didn't know if the baby cried when it was lifted out. Did it need resuscitation? Did it need little things? Did it wee straight away on dad? That bit is missing. That seemed to be really important to women. And as midwives and obstetricians, we don't document that. We write that, yes, we resuscitated five inflation breasts, whatever. They have a missing piece of their birth, these women. Um, they are more likely to not bond with their baby and that cause all the inherent subsequent problems. They are more likely to develop depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. And to me, they're 
more importantly, the more unlikely to be unsatisfied with their birth. It matters to these 2.7 million babies um, because if mum, uh, if dad provides skin to skin whilst mum can't because she's fast asleep, babies do stop crying and become calmer and less stressed twice as fast. Um, Thermal regulation is achieved sooner. You're going to get less babies being un unscheduled babies being re admitted to the neonatal unit, and it helps with pre-feeding behaviour, which promotes breastfeeding initiation. I am not for one second suggesting that skin to skin with dad is the same, but it's got vast leaps and bounds in neonatal intensive care units, what they call kangaroo mother care. But it, it's not as good as mum, but it does come a close second. It matters to these 2.7 million dads because they feel abandoned and excluded. Um, they have little or no paternal satisfaction. They are less likely to bond with their baby and child. This has knock-on effects. So you, you, dads are less likely to, children are more likely as they grow that aren't involved with dad from the outset, uh, don't have a good bond. They do less well educationally. They have more, um, more likely to get in trouble with the police. They have higher IQs um, if they get bond with the dad. More likely to develop depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. And I've met dads who, because of traumatic births, not just GA sections, that they don't go, they won't have sex with a partner again and the marriage breaks down. It's just a thing. Some of whom um, feel like this. And that is the end for me. Thank you. I'm sorry, I've seen a few questions now, but I don't... Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I will start going. I'm not sure how this works. I will start going. So, uh, sorry, that's um, me forgetting to turn my microphone. Oh, on. right. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ian for that um, wonderful summary of your research in 2011. Um, so we can open the floor now to any questions that anybody has for Ian. So you can either put your hand up and I can turn your mic on if you have one, or as we've got a lot of people just listening to the presentation, if you're happy typing your questions. Ian, can you see the public chat at the moment? Uh, yes, I can see the list down the side, yep. So, um, We've got a question from Portia there, just questioning the, the use of your last image there. Do you want to just explain a little bit more how that came about from your research? Um, the, the closing slide, they felt like the end of the tether, they couldn't take any more. They just wanted to get out of it. And that if that meant it was one dad that was talking to, it wasn't part of my research. And he said the end of it just it was at the end of the rope. He couldn't take any more. He just wanted to get away and stop the hurt he was feeling. Um, and his words, he was talking about ending it all. Um, I just linked it when they said he ended the rope to me, that was a natural progression, but I am a bit of a dramatist, I believe. Mm. Thank you. Have you had any experience of, um, of men or partners, female partners as well, being allowed into general anaesthetic for serving sections? <laughs> I haven't, but there was an anaesthetist, and I was trying. I was I was trying to find the emails. Following my research, there was an, an anaesthetist in Scotland who obviously thought similar to me. Didn't think dads would cause the problems, and they were doing a small trial. And I cannot find where it is. But their initial feedback, I, um, the emails, was that it wasn't causing any of the problems that people surmised it would. Um, but I do think we need to have longer-term studies to see if. If dad can fill in the missing piece of the birth for mum, if it's reducing post-traumatic stress disorder, I do, we need more work. The only reason I've revisited, and I know it was a time, this was 2011, it's still going on. I, I'm still going into maternity units at the minute in my current role, and this, we're still excluding dads. It's not, there's no reason for it. If we're evidence-based care, there's no reason whatsoever for it. There's a, there's a question from Meg here, um, which I'll read for the people that are accessing via their phones or don't have the chat function. We must be able to start enabling partners to attend GA sections, but do you think that the common reason for a GA, fetal distress, is what prevents the providers to protect the partners from further distress? Yes, I think that was part of the reason. I mean, the main thing, like I said in the presentation, the main thing is the emergency. You need to get mum and baby out and being part of that team, 
albeit junior, as a student midwife, first year student midwife, you're on a board done. Do you know what I mean? It's wonderful you've done it. Uh, I never gave a thought to dads until, like I said, I saw the one. They are, I think they are trying to protect them. They're saying dads don't want to be there um, and they're not going to be of any use. Um, so, yes, they probably are, but no one's looked into it. And I don't think, similar to when they were trying to get dads into normal birth in the 60s and uh, dads into spinal anesthetic cesarean sections, they were had greater numbers. Certainly, we've got a great number now of uh, spinal sections. These numbers are still relatively small, despite my painting up the bigger picture. Still relatively small. Um, there's probably not a very great voice, I would say. And well, have, you any, oh, have you seen any? Have you seen any any thoughts from the Birth Trauma Association? Margaret's asking there what, of what their views are on dads being allowed. Um, do you know? I honestly don't know. I've never thought of that. Sorry, and if I don't know. I, don't, I, I wasn't aware of anybody um, looking at dad's trauma other than y y uh, your coach. Having said that, I never looked for it, to be fair. I found that other one by accident. So that's an interesting point. I would have to have a look at that. But thank you. And have you managed to get your work published at all, Ian? It was in, um, yeah, I was starting my job as a consultant midwife at the time. So it was published through my dissertation tutor and one of the, one of my, I ended up having four uh, linked people. So yes, it did get published in the Patsy Midwife back in 2014, which I think is a shame with a lot of things. You get it published or whatever, but it's not changed. It doesn't seem to have changed anything. So I, I obviously didn't apply enough. We need to work on it more. So this is why I'm having another go now to see if we can crack this one. Yeah, I think the, the, you're right. There's a lack of research in this area of birth partners and their involvement. But um, as as perhaps we look at the title of International Day of the Midwife being the defenders of women's rights, it's actually women and their families. Yeah, I mean, I was looking for this as a part of the father, being a dad um, and being in that room for the 40. I, I used to call it a cell. It wasn't a cell. I wasn't locked in. But, it, you know, you just tell, stay like, like you tell the dog, <laughs> you, you stay in that room. And it, it, it was awful. Um, and I looked at it from the dad's perspective. But there are benefits to baby of being there. There's a South African doctor, and I can't remember his name, who did research and with some other people that have done research into skin to skin with dads. And it is, does come as a close second. You can get benefits for baby. But also for mum, if this can help take away that missing piece of the birth, I don't know, even when we went on to film a birth, maybe. I don't, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I do think we need to do something. Just It's a small number, but... Um, and from, um, the, from the, the dads that you spoke to, we've got another question there about um, surely it's possible for babies to be taken to the partner as soon as possible if they come out with great apgars uh, and high fives, everyone in the room. Can't this baby be taken to the partner within a short space of time? Did the dads you spoke to find that they did have um, their babies brought to them quickly, or was there a delay? No, uh, they, they weren't. They weren't brought to the. Uh, I believe it's happened occasionally, sometimes, but basically because dad's not in theatre, there's no midwife is where dad is, and midwife has overall responsibility of mum and baby. Um, well, until the obstetrician's finished, um, so the midwife. We're expected to keep an eye on mum. Um, to me, the no-brainer is like, exactly like you say. Nothing wrong with that. Give baby to dad. Uh, that would be a compromise, but that wouldn't sort the missing piece out. But that that would certainly um, that would that would certainly um, help with the baby thermoregulation, pre-feeding behaviour. And it, babies calm down as long as dad's not been overseas or working on an oil rig. Babies hear dad's voice as well from 16, 20 weeks. It is a calming effect on baby and it keeps them warmer. You're less like, yeah. And uh, we've got an interesting viewpoint there that it takes a man midwife to identify this as the traumatic experience. So maybe actually we should be advocating for, for more males to enter the profession. Um, my th I think the best person to do the job should should be doing it irrespective of the genitalia I, I'm, I'm not a great believer of getting more dads in i know i believe in the uk we've got about 100 120 um and i've met quite a few of them they are good midwives but yeah the best people should be doing the job not not just getting more but yes it certainly brings another perspective to it it's it's really interesting that actually we've got um some comments coming up here now that they have seen dads that section when their partners have been under general anaesthetic. So we've got one um, that they were, have seen two general 
uh, anesthetics for sections where both dads were there. One was fetal distress and one was uh, a failed spinal and they would never exclude them for that reason. And they do skin to skin with the dad um, in the theatre. What a brilliant uh, advocate. Yeah, so forward thinking. And, and I, I can understand the concerns. And like I say, as a midwife at the start, when you're just running, you're saving lives and you tick a box, another cup of tea, onto the next one. Do you know what I mean? You feel like you're doing the right thing. But these women and babies are going home with the dads. And if we don't include them from the outset, the benefits of including dads and the problems caused by excluding them is, 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 is yeah, is... Yeah, we need to look at it all. Problem is, is maternity services having enough time to do it, isn't it? Having someone to come and talk to dad, having someone to sit with him while he's in theatre and say, do this, do that. But like I say, at, at, when they go into resuscitation now, um, resuscitating a relative or child or whatever, they stay in the room. Well, it's quite common practice in this country. And actually, perhaps it's highlighting another issue about um, communication skills and empathy. Like somebody else has mentioned, we as midwives really need to be mindful of giving that informed information to the partner, the mother, in whichever situation happens. Yeah, one dad in, in my research did suggest that we had a laminated sign on the wall. He said, just stand me in front of the sign that says, plan A, we're going to section because of distress. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. It's going to be 50 minutes, whatever. He said, and then someone could just come to me and say, no, that, skip that. We've gone to plan B. We've had to resuscitate baby. Like a, He called it an idiot-proof guide. Um, and I know we don't have spare staff to sit around with people. Unless the labour was quiet, then that's fair enough. But yeah, we're just... I wasn't taught this in my degree, and I'm not aware that partners are that, that were taught to look after it. And midwives, I don't know whether we have the time or the capacity. Well, I, I, mean, I know a lot of areas are cutting back on parent craft classes, for example, um, antenatal classes. So, Okay, is there any more questions for Ian before we move on? I think the you've provided us with some, some great insight here into perhaps an avenue that some of us haven't even thought of and, and definitely have provoked more thinking. Can't see any more questions coming up. Okay, so no. thank you very much, Ian, for, for presenting that research and, and I hope you get a chance to explore it further and, and maybe do some studies on the effects if fathers are allowed into the births. Yeah, I mean, I have a th there are some research, again, I found it, so it's yeah. really big, I forgot to mention, there are, um, the, there's some studies done, one in the 70s and one later on, mentioned in Dennis Walsh's uh, normal birth book, that where dads are trained appropriately, they can keep birth normal, and they're as, almost as good as doulas, I'd, I'd, I think dads should be as good as doulas, but they could be there to support, they can fill in, and this is just a, a certain aspect of it, but it's having someone, yeah. It, 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 it's it, it's getting the funding to do it, isn't it? The problem is, and maternity services certainly in this country are so stretched. But thank you. And there's a suggestion there about you um, going on the maternity outcomes matter page on Facebook and uh, and talking about your research. I think that's something that maybe you could take forward. Yeah, I'm more than happy, uh, Margaret, to do that. Yes, I um, I've not been on that one. I don't think. I don't think. But yes, I'm more than happy to. Yeah. Anything that publicises to get this stopped, but thank you. Brilliant, thank you, thank you. And uh, it's a reminder that we're just uh, not only defending the women, but the birth partners as well and keeping them informed and part of the decision-making process.